All right. Well, then, without further ado, uh, I am going to go ahead and move on to the first session of the day, which, as I mentioned, is a keynote by Assemblymember Laura Friedman. Um, and I will go ahead and hand it over to uh, an SVBC board member, Jamie Chen. So, Jamie, go ahead. Thanks, Shiloh. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jamie Chen. I'm a member of the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition Board um, and really excited to be here and to see everyone. I love being able to see a little window into people's lives. I'm calling in from my kitchen here in San Jose. Um, and a little bit about myself. Uh, oh, I did want to say, please make sure if you have any questions or comments, as Shiloh mentioned, feel free to drop those in the chat box and we'll be monitor monitoring the chat. Um, so a little bit about me, I joined the board because I love biking, um, also hate despairing about climate change. So I got involved with this amazing organization um, that's really working on transforming transportation culture and building community and power via a common love of bicycles. Um, my background is in organizing. I started out organizing security officers to form labor unions. Um, I ran a few electoral campaigns. Uh, registered and mobilized thousands of voters in Santa Clara County. And I spent uh, many years doing deep community organizing here in San Jose for immigration and food justice. Um, when I first got started as an organizer, I would say that people often mistook my profession as something to do with closets or tool sheds. Uh, I do enjoy getting hangers and tools in the right place, but community organizing is really, in my opinion, much more inspiring. Uh, and at its core, what I would say is that organizing is really about bringing people together to see themselves as part of something greater than each individual and working together towards a shared vision or dream. At SVBC, that shared vision is one where people from all walks of life in Santa Clara and San Mateo counties can safely bike or use whatever form of active transit they prefer. I'm really proud to hold that vision with all of you here today. Um, and I really hope that through making connections and learning from each other through this bike summit, we can really take one step closer towards that vision. Um, so I would like to begin introducing our keynote speaker with a quote from Rihanna Gunn Wright, who's, a, who's the climate policy director at the Roosevelt Institute and one of the authors of the Green New Deal. Uh, so she writes, if politics is a fight to elect people who reflect and share our values, Policy is a fight to actually enact those values, to mold the world through the work of government into what we think it should be. It's not every day that we're able to hear from an elected official who not only shares our values, but is working hard to enact those values. So it's really my great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today for this year's annual SVBC Bike Summit, Assembly Member Laura Friedman, Chair of the Assembly Committee on Transportation. Assemblymember Friedman is a steadfast advocate for the environment, sustainable communities, and active transportation. She's called by the California Biking Coalition as one of California's strongest champions for bicycling. She has two bills in the works in support of biking and active transit, one to reduce traffic fatalities and the other to encourage active transit options, which also includes providing funding to design safe bikeways. She can be seen commuting to the state capitol on a cruiser type bike, with a single fixed gear and calls this commute often the best part of her day. Please welcome Assembly Member Laura Friedman. Hi everyone. It's so great to be here with you today. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I've really enjoyed listening uh, to you for the past 10, 15 minutes and reading the um, uh, testimonials in the chat about what you enjoy about biking. Um, I come to the bike community. First, when I, well, just a little bit of background. I, I came to politics kind of sideways. I had been a um, uh, uh, executive in the film industry, moved to Los Angeles in 1992 to work at Paramount after working at HBO and other companies in New York. Uh, always thought that I would be uh, forever a film person and never thought that I would do anything else. And then when I got to Los Angeles, I started getting involved with some of the local uh, political groups. And the next thing you knew, I, well, I, I applied for and was appointed to a commission, a city commission in Glendale, which is where I lived. It's a great way to start um, in policy is by 
volunteering on a commission or a board. And then I started watching the city council and realized that, you know, it wasn't that they had done such a horrible job, but it was, you know, five older white guys. And uh, they hadn't had a woman on the council for 10 years. And since the city was founded in about 1916, there had only been about seven or eight women council members. It was uh, kind of shocking. So I ran against uh, three incumbents and ended up beating them all for my seat and became the first person, I think, in Glendale's history to start pushing for active transportation and to try to make that a reality in a city that had been completely car centric. And I will tell you that my colleagues thought that I was absolutely insane. Uh, they thought that I was trying to, you know, entitle kind of hipsters from Silver Lake to pass through the city or spandex wearing, um, you know, speed freaks who just wanted to disrupt traffic and weave around and cause confusion. And they didn't understand that bicycles were, yes, their recreation, but also of course, a mode of transportation. And they weren't seeing the people, a lot of the essential workers who were using bicycles as their only and primary means to get around our city. They were seemed to be completely blind to the uh, often Latino people who were coming into work in our city or traveling through our city and who deserve just as a safe way of passage as anybody else. So I was able to push a lot of bicycle infrastructure through in my time in city council and then ran for assembly in 2016 and won. Now, after about a year in the assembly, I was um, had the great honor of being assigned to chair the natural resources committee. And I thought that that was the absolute best committee for me. Uh, climate has been a huge part of my focus in the assembly and sustainability. I'm the mom of an eight year old. I worry every single day about the planet that she's going to inherit. I don't think any of us can ignore what's happening around the world uh, at this point, and certainly here in California with the fires. And it's indisputable that this should be, that if you're not working on climate, uh, you are really missing the chance to work on the biggest existential crisis uh, that humanity has ever faced. And it still shocks me that there are people who don't wanna think about climate and integrate climate into their work and, and what's happening to our environment. So I spend a lot of my, my work doing climate and natural resources was the perfect place for me to do that because that's the committee that oversees air quality, emissions, our air boards, CARB, our coastal conservancies. And I was able to bring a lot of that work to um, a lot of that focus to the work that I was doing on electrification of buildings, on clean air standards, on everything else. But the one area in California that's been a stubborn outlier when it comes to our climate work is transportation. Transportation is the largest chunk of our greenhouse gas emissions. It's the area where we've gone in the wrong direction as a state with vehicle miles traveled and emissions increasing year after year. And it has been a really stubborn outlier. And even though uh, Governor Newsom is a visionary in this regard. It takes this very seriously. It has extremely ambitious uh, zero emission vehicles goals. That's not going to save us. That by the time we get all of those ZEVs onto the road, it's going to be too late. And that's only part of our problem. Electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles are a part of our solution, but they don't solve some of our other issues like land use. Um, which, you know, cars taking up a huge chunk of real estate for parking, for moving around, uh, that could otherwise be used for, um, for green spaces. Like our housing issue with congestion being the number one excuse that people give for the reason that they don't want to add new housing. So since my time in the council, I've always tried to make people understand that we have, when it comes to climate, a triad which is in terms of our local connection to, to climate and to mobility. And the triad is one side of a triangle is transportation. The other side of the triangle is housing. And the other side is climate. And those are part of the same issue. And they need to be unsiloed and treated as the interconnected issues that they are. The way that we live and move around our city is connected to to sustainability. You can't be an environmentalist unless you are willing to make the changes that we need to make our way of life more sustainable. And by the way, this shouldn't be painful. You all know that it's actually better. It's a more pleasant and healthy way to live when you are within walking and biking distance of the things that you need to live your life. Uh, and I think in the Bay Area, you've demonstrated that very, very well with walkable, bikeable communities that, by the way, everybody wants to live in. 
Um, whereas in Los Angeles, we still have you know, primarily a sprawl community. We haven't done density well, and we haven't demonstrated that, that sort of proof of concept that it's more pleasant when you can walk down the block to get a gallon of milk than when you have to get in your car and drive two miles or three miles and then fight people for parking and deal with congestion on the road. It's unhealthy. It disconnects you from your community. It causes people to be you know, in their cars and angry at each other all the time, as opposed to being out interacting with each other face to face, saying good morning, enjoying our, our fresh air and everything else that that kind of lifestyle can give. So these are interconnected issues that need to be treated as such. So I'll just give you a snapshot of what I've been working on to try to, to de-silo. Oh, so earlier this year, Speaker Rendon moved me out of natural resources and over to chair transportation. And it was a little bittersweet because like I said, I love chairing natural resources. I got to push the envelope on so many incredible issues, but now I have the opportunity to make an even bigger change by changing California's policies about transportation to de-emphasize car travel, try to focus our, our uh, emphasis on active transportation and transit, and to um, make California's transportation policies as progressive and in, as aspirational as our clean energy policies and many of our other policies that we rightfully show with pride to the rest of the world. And it's not going to be easy. These are entrenched uh, policies when it comes to the way that we fund transportation policies, the way that our engineers are trained, the way that our cities think about mobility, the way that many of our residents think about their own personal freedom is all wrapped around this sort of 1950s vision of everybody always going everywhere in a single occupant car. So I'm excited to talk to all of you because you are the advocates that make my work possible. And I thank you for that. So um, just one of the, so there's sort of two tacks that I've been taking when it comes to doing this and when it comes to bicycles. One is working on road violence and traffic, traffic violence and how unsafe our streets are, which we saw last year with COVID where less people were driving and we had less cars on the road. And despite this, we had a 24% increase in the number of traffic fatalities um, in, 2000, in 2020. Uh, it's the singles highest year jump um, in 96 years. So in 100 years, last year was the deadliest year for traffic fatalities, showing us that the only thing preventing absolute carnage on our streets is traffic congestion. Um, so we have got to do a lot more to stop that. So I introduced um, AB 43, which is a bill looking at the 85th percentile, which is the arcane way that cities are forced to raise speed limits to accommodate speeders. Uh, this is something that's been frustrating for people for many, many years, and I think that we finally have a chance to allow for cities and uh, to take accident data into account when they set speed limits and not to constantly have to raise their speed limits over and over again. The second bill that um, I worked on that didn't make it through um, at this point was with David Chu from, from the Bay Area, which was AB 550, which was the companion piece to AB 43, which tried to allow for the use of automated speed cameras. Now, this was a bill that we spent a lot of time writing with, with equity in mind to make sure that it was used to um, uh, really enhance communities, not to be punitive to, to communities, particularly communities that tend to B, have the most amount of high injury networks, which are our disadvantaged and communities of color. You know, these are the communities that saw the biggest brunt of traffic fatalities, but we can't allow enforcement to be used as a cudgel in these communities. So we built a really cutting edge equity measures into that bill and yet it was held. So we're gonna be working on that again next year and really need to loop in these effective, uh, effective communities better to be advocates for uh, road safety and to give you know, input into the measure as well to make sure that it's protective of those communities and, and a benefit. Uh, some bills that I've been working on with other authors, AB 122, which allows for cyclists to use stop signs as yield signals as opposed to having to come to complete stops under certain circumstances where it's safe to do so. Uh, AB 1238, which will decriminalize jaywalking, something that's been frustrating to me forever. You know, as a woman who walks, you know, all the time, walks alone, particularly at night, 
there's no reason why I should have to stand waiting, you know, either waiting for a red light when I know there's no traffic or being forced to walk sometimes a half a mile out of my way just across a dang street because no one thought to put a mid block crossing into that road. So this decriminalizes jaywalking when it's safe to do so. And uh, those are some of the primary measures that I've been working on. Um, then another measure that uh, I think is really important that you will all, I think, be happy about is AB 11, um, what is, I always forget the bill numbers. I am dyslexic and bill numbers are like my, my kryptonite. Um, it's, I think it's 1147, which, uh, and if I'm wrong about that, I, hopefully someone will correct in the chat. But this is a bill, it's a very wonky bill of trying to build on previous legislation about sustainable communities. And the idea behind this is based on the 15 minute city concept that you've probably heard about where everything should be within a 10 or 15 minute walk, bike or transit ride of where people live so that we don't, so that we find ways of de-emphasizing sprawl and encouraging um, the kind of density that allows people to get out of their cars and to either walk, bike um, or use transit safely. And what this bill does is it, it, it pushes cities to incorporate that concept into their planning. And that can be done you know, in many different ways, whether it's changing the use in a neighborhood like mine, where we don't allow any commercial uses in our residential neighborhoods, which are sort of large sprawling neighborhoods. So why not allow a daycare? Why not allow a corner bodega? Why not allow somebody to, to have an accountant office right in a residential neighborhood where, where it's a low impact use and people can walk and bike there safely. The bill also includes $500 million to be used for active transportation projects that reduce vehicle miles traveled, particularly bicycle highways that will connect communities, connect residential areas to job centers and commerce areas, and really um, seek to build on the funding that comes through SB1, which is the gas tax measure. What I would like to do is to see us think of bicycle highways as as much important transportation infrastructure as highways that are for cars. You know, this is something that is a practical way of mobility, that's an equitable way of getting people around, and we need to make cycling and walking safer to encourage more people to do it. And by the way, we have the co-benefits, not just of reducing greenhouse gases, but of having a healthier community, where we see one of the biggest proliferation I see in my community are dialysis centers. You know, we have got to also work on ways of making people healthier through healthy lifestyles and getting out and exercising in our beautiful climate is a part of that. So I don't know how long I'm supposed to talk. I can talk forever and very quickly, but I think I'd rather pause, uh, take a breath, take a drink of my coffee and let you all maybe ask questions or I can keep going, whatever, whatever is your pleasure. Um, keep going, stop. Uh, we do have a few questions for you, okay. Assembly Member, but if you want to keep going, I think we've got another 10 minutes for your oh, keynote. Wow. Okay. So let me uh, just talk. You know, I don't have to talk to you all about why active transportation is important. You already know it. Sometimes I have to spend a lot of time explaining that to people, but you all get it. Let me just talk a bit about this year's budget. Um, we, we had a historic surplus in the budget this year, and our governor really gets it when it comes to active transportation and how important it is and this and, and transit as well. And I wanna just call out some of the investments that you're gonna be seeing uh, rolled out in the short term. $3 billion in general fund revenue is going to be used to fund transportation infrastructure across the state. And that's from the state. We are hoping that we're getting another big chunk from the federal government that we can use to really accelerate a lot of our infrastructure projects. And I will just say that I have been arguing that if you that for all of the reasons that we know about when climate and everything else that if you want to the best the thing you can i think spend spend stimulus money on is transportation infrastructure if you're trying to get people to work quickly if you're trying to modernize our states if you're trying to reduce greenhouse gases if you're trying to double down on community health what better way than to invest in transit and active transportation i would argue that particularly transit will give you the greatest benefit for stimulus dollars, for federal stimulus dollars than pretty much anything else out there. Uh, so I am hoping that the Biden administration is thinking that way and that we see money going towards mass transit that we, we desperately need to move people around, to make people you know, have a better quality of life and to allow for housing to, to really um, go where it needs to go. 
So another, so $1 billion will go to delivering critical transit projects in Los Angeles in preparation for the 2028 Olympics. Another $1 billion will go towards competitive uh, grants for transit and rail projects statewide. An additional $500 million was sent to the active transportation programs, as I mentioned, which more than doubles the annual funds given to the program. Um, and also um, there will, through a, a bill that I have co-authored, AB 1117, e-bike um, e rebates will now become a reality so that it's not just clean cars that we're going to be investing in. It's also e-bikes. And I would thank um, the Bike Coalition, California Bike Coalition, um, and um, all of their advocates um, who have made that possible and been pushing for years for e-bikes to be part of our green uh, mobility solution. I rode my first e-bike two days ago in San Francisco, and I felt like Lance Armstrong. Uh, you know, I had no idea uh, what an e-bike felt like, and, you know, it's it was really awesome. I, I do try to bike. I, I used to, I gave up my car for two years when I came onto the Glendale City Council, and one of my biggest problems was I am not, you know, I'm a middle-aged woman who's not particularly healthy and active. Um, you know, I mean, I don't go to a gym or anything like that. I just sort of walk and bike around, and I always had to push my bike up my hill because I live in the hills in Glendale. And it was kind of like a bummer way to end my day. And I think with an e-bike, I might be able to get up my hill. So it's something that I would love to try to do. And, you know, I think it would definitely make me more likely to use that bike for those longer trips. Uh, and I don't think that I'm cheating by doing that. Um, so I think I will stop there and see about questions that you all have. Great, thank you so much, assembly member. Um, there are a lot of great questions coming in through the chat, so keep those coming. Um, and we'll start out with a few of our moderated questions first. Uh, and so, as you may have heard in the beginning, that I'm uh, have been an organizer for much of my career. So I'm often on the other side of the table, bringing a group of community members to meet with elected officials. I think you called us the advocates that make your work possible. Um, there's lots of concerned citizens here. Would love to hear from you if you could shed some insight. What is it like? What's your experience of organizing advocacy groups? What works? What should we avoid? Do you have any advice for us? And that's a great question. I think that the bike community is very mobilized, um, very organized, uh, more so than many other groups. I guess if I was going to give any advice at this point, I would be to uh, I think that there is sometimes an image of who bike advocates are, um, you know, sort of young male tech employees. You know, it's kind of that sort of the image that some people have in their mind. And I think showing the great diversity of people who care about this issue, you know, that it's young, it's old, it's, it's multi-ethnic, it's uh, multi-income level, um, and that there are a lot of people who use bicycles um, for their day-to-day -day life who don't have the time, you know, to necessarily be that voice, but that they're out there and, and making sure that they are seen and heard as well, uh, I think is really important. Um, that the bike community can't be seen as sort of a niche advocacy group. Um, it needs to be seen as, as having the, the support and, and that it's a broad cross-section of our community. And it's ch children as well, that children deserve the chance to bike around their community safely. I mean, I had that when I was a kid. When I was a kid, we used to all bike in the street all the time. And people just took that for granted. And now, it, you know, we sort of allowed ourselves to slip into a place where most parents don't think that that's safe. And in most places, it's not particularly safe. So how to re reclaim the streets for everybody and make sure that we prioritize the most vulnerable users of the road, and that's people that are walking and people on bicycles. And, you know, reframing the narrative of what traffic violence is and, um, uh, um, you know, making it something that's cause for concern across the community. I, I will say I live in Glendale and we had a, a, a three person fatality um, on one of our residential streets last week. And this is not uncommon in my area. Street racing particularly and, and just really reckless driving has become so out of control that people are becoming almost blind to it. And we have got to push back on that and say that it's just not acceptable. It's not acceptable to drive 100 miles an hour on the highway. It's not acceptable to drive 70 miles an hour on a city street where there's pedestrians and other, other vehicles. And I see it literally every single day in Los Angeles. Uh, and it's, it's really terrifying. So I think that you know connecting the bike, bicycle advocacy 
Also with that larger safety concern is something that allows you to maybe have more ears out there uh, as well. Because I, I do think that there are intersecting issues where you can build coalitions with people who don't really care about bicycles, but they do care about street safety. So I would say, you know, um, diversifying, um, finding those intersecting issues where you can bring in people who aren't necessarily always on your side, sort of those older homeowners who are scared to drive, um, uh, you know, the moms that are out there. Uh, I mean, you have them, but you can, you know, even bring them in wider, sort of the PTA moms. Um, but you do a great job. So these are just, you know, they're, they're not criticisms. They're just, you know, thoughts of maybe ways of broadening even that, that coalition, even having a bigger voice. I love that. Thank you so much for, um, for that advice. And it, it leads really well to the next question, which is uh, we at SBBC, we're really committed to transportation and justice and racial justice. Would love to hear from you. What do you see as prime opportunities to promote transportation and racial justice in the coming years here in California? Well, I think that you, like many other groups, are, are really doing a good job at, at um, bringing in those diverse voices and making sure that the, the voice, diverse voices and the, the various communities that are already in your, your um, coalition are, are spotlighted and that they you know, that they're able to have their own voice and that you're willing to listen to voices of other communities that maybe have different needs, that want other issues like policing also uh, to be part of the agenda. Um, so I do think that um, I've seen that in, in the bicycle um, uh, groups, I've seen that in the environmental movements, you know, taking environmental justice more seriously and, and really pushing some of those voices to sort of the, the, the front of the line and letting those voices speak. Um, so, uh, I do think that that's work that is in progress, but also, you know, making sure that you're in those in different communities and that you have a presence in lots of different communities and that you go to places that you haven't gone before, you know, going to the faith based groups, going to the churches, going to the PTA moms, you know, in black and brown communities um, and um, uh, and being there as well. Um, you know, I, I don't know what what you do on the ground necessarily. I'm not there with you everywhere. Um, so I don't want to presuppose that you're not doing that work, um, but sometimes I know that those communities do feel, you know, can feel left out. And they may have different needs, you know, bicycle advocacy may look different, you know, what those communities need will like, look different. Uh, so, you know, maybe it's not a bike lane, you know, maybe it's something different that that's the, the highest priority in some communities. I do think that as a policymaker, one of my jobs is to make sure that we get resources into communities that have been underserved. Um, you know, one of the beauties of, of AB 550, the speed enforcement bill, the, the camera bill, is that it said that all the money that was collected in, from that program had to go into the communities where the cameras were, you know, so that you sort of couldn't go into a disadvantaged community, give a bunch of tickets there, and then put the money somewhere else in that city. That money would go right into that same street to make that street safer, to put in the trees, the medians, the bus, protected bus shelters, all the things that would make that street a slower street had to be done right there. So, you know, making sure that our advocacy also is about putting resources into communities that haven't had resources. Yeah, I think that is definitely something that SBBC is thinking a lot and doing more on now is how do we uh, bring in different communities? How do we also think about, think more expansively about what uh, policy solutions, what organizing solutions that we can work for? Um, and actually, there's a question coming in from the chat that is specifically about this, the speed safety camera legislation, uh, and would love to hear you talk a little bit more about specific measures to address those equity and privacy issues. Uh, and also, how are the police on it? It sounds like last time they didn't like the bill. You know, um, I was not the primary author. I was a, a principal co-author and I worked a lot with David Chu. He would know a little bit more about, you know, kind of how the advocacy went. From my, from my recollection, we did get law enforcement neutral on the bill. So they did not oppose in the end. Um, the bill was set up as a pilot program. So it was limited to the number of cities, you know, which cities were pre-prescribed in the bill. Uh, the amount of, of sort of mileage that could be used, the percentage of streets was very pre-prescribed. And then there were a lot of equity measures in the bill. Um, the, first of all, in terms of privacy, the data, um, you know, the, there were very strict lock boxes around data. Uh, there was no, um, you wouldn't capture any faces in the bill. It was only license plates. 
So it was kind of like a parking ticket where the car would get the ticket, not the individual. So it was, it didn't matter who was driving. There was no strikes on anyone's license or anything like that. It was set up more like a parking ticket where the car would get a ticket for going too fast. The same way that, you know, when you get a parking ticket, it doesn't matter who's driving. It doesn't, you can't go to court and say, Hey, it was my kid who parked it in the wrong place. It would be the same thing with, with this. Um, the, the fines were extremely low. Like if you were going to get a speeding ticket, you wanted this speeding ticket because a regular speeding ticket is hundreds of dollars. This speeding ticket, for one thing, for the first six months, you would only get a warning unless you were going more than, I think it was 15 miles an hour over the speed limit. So we were basically warning people for a while. And then you would get, I think it was a $50 ticket. So it was the cheapest ticket you could get like for any moving violation. Um, and you, the, the community had to warn people before they came to the camera. Because the idea was that we were trying to slow people down. We weren't trying to give tickets, right? If you're just giving gazillions of tickets, you sort of fail. You really want to slow people down. So you had to have flashing lights coming in that said you are now entering a speed camera zone. Also, if the cities didn't reduce the number of tickets they were getting within a certain amount of time, they either had to invest in traffic calming right there at the location or they couldn't use the camera anymore. So it was really also with an eye towards getting them to invest in traffic calming in those areas. Uh, again, the money had to go back right into that street, you know, into that community, uh, that zone, so that you upgraded that zone with whatever traffic. It was also it was used to sort of pay for the traffic calming that the community that the city would do. There was public outreach built into the bill, so they had to do public outreach before they installed these. It was only to be allowed in certain um, high, uh, certain areas, sort of high injury network communities, uh, communities where you already had. Um, you know, an unusual number of traffic injuries because of speeding. So there was a whole bunch of stuff built into the bill to try to be protective uh, and additive uh, to the communities that would have had the tickets. So I actually felt like the bill had a great balance of, of protecting people's privacy, of, of warning people, of putting the money back in the communities, of making sure that it couldn't be used punitively because you couldn't, if you didn't decrease the number of tickets, you couldn't use them anymore. You had to move them around. So there was a lot of stuff built in uh, to the bills. And I will say that, interestingly, the data from around the country on traffic, on speed enforcement camera, oh, and also you couldn't ticket unless the person was going more than, I think it was six miles an hour over the speed limit. You know, and these are being used on streets where the speed limit's often 20, 25 miles an hour. So it, it's like, it wasn't, we weren't trying to gotcha, like you're going two miles an hour over the speed limit and gotcha. This was only if you were going, you know, sort of pretty fast, you know, much faster than, I think it was even eight miles an hour over the speed limit. So you really had to be speeding to a good, a good amount, not just you didn't notice you were uh, you know, going a little bit faster. Now, other cities are doing this. I think New York City now has this very similar program without a lot of the equity measures. Here's the interesting thing. The, re the recidivism rate when you use a speed camera, it's something like 98% or 97% of people never get another ticket. Like it's an incredibly successful program at getting people to just sort of pay more attention and stop speeding. And don't quote me on the 90, whatever, but I know it's in the 90s. It's, it's much, much higher than many other, you know, things that, pe that people get tickets for or get, you know, citations for. Uh, I wish that other, you know, crimes had that kind of rate. Uh, um, so I think that there's a lot built into this bill. We're going to try again next year, but here's where I'll turn it back to you. What we really need or we need the communities where what we'll be seeing the bulk of these cameras, the, you know, the black and brown and disadvantaged communities to say they want them. Uh, they tend, the high injury networks tend to be in disadvantaged communities. It is black and brown children that are bearing the disproportionate brunt of traffic violence. Um, and uh, so we need to, to do better outreach to get these, to get those communities to, to weigh in in a positive fashion to wanting to, to help slow the traffic down in their communities. And so that means that we need advocates like yourselves to help us get those voices in the mix because I believe that that's the reason that the bill didn't make it out was over concern for you know, kind of these equity concerns which are the right concerns to have. And I think we, we did write the bill that did all of that but now we need you know, the communities to kind of come on board too. Yeah, it sounds like it's quite comprehensive. And I remember I am not from California when I moved out here and heard how expensive the tickets were. It definitely impacted how I drove, I would say. <laughs> yeah, me too. Um, so I, we have a lot of great questions coming in. I'd like to move to a question that came in at the beginning, which is um, Caltrans can sometimes be a barrier to progressive and safer street design. So any thoughts that you have on Caltrans reform? 
Well, I, you know, I have heard, I was just in the Bay Area the past three days doing a transit tour, a uh, very uh, comprehensive transit of your many, many transit agencies and many transit uh, uh, different uh, options that you have. And, uh, you know, to the T, every single one of them, including the, the active transportation people that we met with said that Caltrans has really undergone a reform in the last few years, you know, possibly with, with Governor Newsom's leadership. I, I'm not sure, if, you know, how much that had to do with it they have seen Caltrans really take a turn towards being a lot more progressive, a lot more willing to work with the active transportation community, a lot more aware about their impact on safe streets and on active transportation. Uh, I want to do more of a deep dive over the rest of the year and really seeing how much work we have to do in that regard to make sure that as cities use SB1 money that they fulfill their obligations to upgrade their streets and to evaluate them for complete streets um, because that's part of their mandate when they do road repair work. I, I suspect that that's not being uniformly done across the state. Uh, so there's a lot that I think we can do from our end as overseers of Caltrans and overseers of SB1 money. Um, you know, I, I, I might want to do a hearing later this year just on this very subject on Caltrans and progressive um, uh, kind of road work and you know how they're viewing all of this and how our cities are implementing our complete streets mandates. Speaking of complete streets, there is a question from the chat also, are there plans to revive SB 127, the complete streets bill that was vetoed by Governor Newsom? We'll keep working on, on complete streets. You know, you've got great advocates with Senator Weiner, um, David Chu, Phil Ting, you, you know, you've got a lot of people in the Bay Area and people down here in Los Angeles who really wanna see uh, this better incorporated into Caltrans everyday operations. You know, and my, my, my feeling is that yes, we need to keep working on legislation, but really what we need is a culture change. You know, we just need California to start thinking of active transportation as transportation infrastructure that's built into everything that we do. You know, and it, it's the legislation's important, but it's really the culture change that's more important. You know, we need every traffic engineer when they look at a street to be looking at it, not just with an eye towards moving cars through, but you know, what does this feel like for pedestrians? What does this feel like for, for, for bicycles? And that should be something that every traffic engineer that, that looks at a road, whether it's Caltrans or someone working at a city or a county is just looking for, and that that's what they think of as a road. Um, you know, the, the, I, I still see far too many places where you don't wanna walk as a pedestrian, you know, that no one's thinking about pedestrians. Um, pedestrian experiences that are unpleasant, pedestrian experiences that are unsafe uh, or that feel unsafe. You know, right here in my own city, I've been trying to get my city for years to stop making me stand in the middle of Glen Oaks Boulevard, a six lane road just across the street. You know, it, it's easy to redesign the, the traffic signals so that I can get across that street safely. I do not feel safe having cars whizzing by me at 50 miles an hour on each side while I'm huddled on a piece of concrete in the middle. You know, things like that. Why are cities not just looking at that and thinking that this is, you know, their mandate? Um, and, you know, I'm just gonna keep pushing and pushing and pushing because until it's pleasant to walk, people aren't gonna wanna walk. And we're gonna keep having people in dialysis centers and people getting hit by cars and people, you know, saying, I don't wanna give up my car. You know, we need to start, we just need a culture change of making that part of our culture. Absolutely. And I know that we always talk a lot about, it's more fun to ride a bike and it's just more exciting and, and you get, and there's been a lot of great chatter in the chat about all of the benefits. Um, so we definitely agree with you there. Uh, so we've got a, I'm very impressed by all the questions that are coming and we've got a question here on your bill. Uh, AB 1147 to support 15 minute neighborhoods and bicycle highways. Dave Snyder writes, it could be the most transformative state transportation law since SB 375, but only if it's funded. So would love to hear from you. What are you doing to help get funding for the vision expressed in the bill and how can we help? So I uh, have had a lot of communication with the Newsom administration, at least with his team in transportation. And originally the bill had $250 million in it. And they kind of came and said, you know, the governor wants to make that 500 million. So I feel like the, the, the administration is on board with the $500 million that's dedicated to active transportation, having a, um, AB 1147 be the framework that guides how that funding is, is rolled out because the bill does include kind of funding formulas, competitive grant programs towards these transformative active transportation programs. 
So they see it as very important. However, I know that they're also planning on introducing a trailer bill that will roll out, that will introduce their 500 million. And my bill, 1147, is in Senate appropriations. So I'm, I'm hopeful that the administration helps get the bill out of appropriations, but it is still possible that Senate appropriations holds the bill. And then we have the 500 million, but without the 1147 framework as to how that's spent, which would I think be bad because that means that that money would just go to the normal cogs the way it always does. It could be used for a bike path in a park as opposed to what it was designed for, which is bike highways, um, commuter biking, um, you know, really making streets safe for people to, to move around um, in a way that will reduce vehicle miles traveled. So um, I would ask that you all turn your advocacy towards Senate appropriations and also to the Senate pro tem, Tony Atkins, who's been a great friend with this, but just making her aware of this bill and saying we really need this, um, that it's important to us as a bicycle community and active transportation community so that we have guardrails around that $500 million. Great. Um, thanks so much. So we're, I think we're zooming into different levels of government. We're going to zoom out now to, uh, would love to hear your thoughts on the federal infrastructure bill that was just passed this week. I would say more, 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 more. Give us more. I would love to see as much federal funding towards active transportation and transit as we can get. I think it, like I said, it checks all the boxes. It's got your job box. It's got your housing box. It's got your clean air box. It's got all of that. And we certainly need it in California. Uh, we need to put a huge investment in active transportation and transit. And hopefully the federal government will help us do that. There's a lot of money in that going to highways. I know that we need to you know, have safe roads and we need to have safe bridges. Uh, I hope that some of that money can also be towards making those roads safe for all users of the roads. Um, and that we, we find ways of, of doing that. I would love to see more of it go towards transit and active transportation. Great, and coming back to the regional level, um, what do you think are the chances of getting regional coordination on transit in large metro areas like ours? We know that there is a seamless Bay Area bill at the state level, but that may have been delayed. It was delayed. Uh, I haven't been in the middle of that. You know, again, that's David Chu's bill. My understanding is that he's still talking to the transit agencies and trying to work out their issues, their challenges, their, their needs to, to, to really make that a reality. Um, you know, I'm just now learning about Bay Area Transit. That's why I was there in the last few days. So I, you know, I, I see with 27 transit, 27 transit agencies what a challenge it is. I do think that whatever challenges the agencies have, it shouldn't be a challenge for the users of transit, you know, that users of transit don't care that they're switching from one to the next. Um, and I think that making the fare, the fares more transparent to the users, making that experience seamless for the users. Clipper card is great. Um, you know, how can that, you know, kind of be improved on? Um, how, I, I do think that making the fares, uh, you know, it seemed, I, I understand that, all of the agencies have different ways that they that they pay for their systems, but it does seem like for a user, you don't want to be paying multiple times for one trip. You, you know, you're taking one trip, you kind of want to pay for one trip. Uh, so I do think that there's opportunities to make this a better experience um, for users. And I, 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 after talking to your agencies, they get that they're they're really committed. From my perspective, it seems like they're committed to trying to solve a lot of these issues. Um, they do want to retain, you know, kind of their own governance. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's going to be a conversation. I don't think you're going to solve it, you know, that easily. But I, you know, with David Chu, I think that he's really close. Coming here from the East Coast, that was one of the hardest things. Oh, you know, I'm sorry. For oh, go ahead. I forgot one bill to mention that's really important to me. And that's AB 1401. Uh, this is a bill that I introduced. It's probably my most controversial bill. It says that within a half a mile of high quality transit, a city or a municipality cannot prescribe uh, or require any parking for any kind of development, that it would be completely up to a developer how much parking they want to have. Um, the idea is that you want to really use that transit and allow for development that uses that transit, as opposed to continually inviting people to have free and cheap and ample parking right next to your train station. Now, I'm not talking about the train stations parking itself. I'm not talking about, I'm not saying that a 
a, a, a BART station somewhere in a rural, you know, in a, a suburban area can't build their own parking lot. I'm saying that a city can't tell a housing development that they have to have two or three spaces per unit to build housing when they're right next to a train station or really close to a train station. They should be able to say, hey, maybe I'm going to offer some units without parking for a lesser price to people who are just taking transit and don't own a car. Maybe I'm going to offer less of a price to someone that you know only wants one space or tandem parking um, and to allow the developers to experiment with that. Why would you build a restaurant right next to a train station and then have to do a parking lot? For one thing, it's a terrible use of land. And for a second, a second thing is it really discourages people from using transit. So this is a um, really important bill to me. It's very controversial. Many of our cities are taking opposed positions. They don't like their local control taken away. A lot of them wanna have a ton of parking, but look, if we're really serious about climate change, we also have to be willing to change the way we live. You know, this idea that we care in the abstract about climate, and yet we're not willing to change anything about our daily lives, including saying, let's let developers decide how much parking they need right next to a train station, to me is like the height of hypocrisy. So, you know, the bill has a lot of challenges, a lot of concerns from a lot of stakeholders. And if you care about this bill, please help with it. It's also right now in Senate appropriations. Good to know Are there that's yeah that I think that's a sticky topic but I yeah I think we're definitely about culture change how do we reimagine the way that we can live the way that we can drive or not drive and use other kinds of transit. Um, there's a question from Bob Walsh actually about parking uh, at Bob Walsh from Bird Rise was just in Sacramento discussing creating parking for bicycles scooters e bikes etc. According to city administrators, the most difficult problem is convincing the community to give up private parking spaces. So what, in your opinion, could policymakers do to make it easier for city staff to create bike parking where it's needed the most? You know, uh, cities in the Bay Area and Long Beach have been very successful in getting businesses to kind of uh, agree to try bike parking. And they've had great success once the bike parking goes in in areas where, where cyclists are, are there of the businesses sort of saying, hey, can we get some more bike parking now, you know, down the block because it, it's so successful. Kind of like, you know, when they were when they were taking away parking spaces and doing outdoor dining, uh, there were a lot of really nervous businesses who felt that people wouldn't walk to their business. But once they had that, they saw that actually it attracted a lot more people to their establishment. You know, now people actually were looking in their window, looking at the pretty things in the window because they weren't whizzing by it at 40 miles an hour. Um, so, I think that demonstrating proof of concept is really the first thing. If you want to just get someone to take that leap of faith or just do it, you know, and the quick streets build model where you don't commit to it, you just, you know, throw down some cones and some paint and do it like overnight and just do it without that public process and, you know, kind of have it there for a while, let people get used to it before you, you know, do, instead of doing you know, eight weeks of, of public con of public process and, and CEQA analysis and all these big things, just do it and say it's temporary, we're gonna try it for two weeks, you know, no harm done for two weeks. Do that, uh, let it sink in and then see what happens. Um, and demonstrate proof of concept, take those businesses who have enjoyed it and like it into the other business districts and let them be the ones who are the ambassadors because other businesses will listen to them. They won't listen to us, but they'll listen to another business who says, my restaurant benefited, my bookstore benefited, my clothing shop benefited, whatever it is, so that they say, okay, I'm willing to try it here. Uh, you know, that's worked in other communities um, and it's, it seems like a model that works. Love that. I think it goes back to what you were saying about getting diverse voices and unlikely allies also to, to champion this. Uh, we've got a question from Catherine Dumont. Uh, why is it so hard to legislate for progressive car-free transportation infrastructure, even with majority democratic California? We heard you say earlier that the state is going in the wrong direction when it comes to car emissions, et cetera? Well, I say fundamentally because we haven't made the investments as a state to make it convenient for people. You know, you can't expect people to, you know, not everyone's going to be an early adopter. Um, certainly in where I live in Los Angeles, it's really hard to use transit, you know? So uh, of course people aren't gonna use it, um, you know, unless they really have to because it's not convenient, it's not pleasant. Uh, it's far. It's a far walk to get to, even to a bus uh, where I live. So we haven't done made the investments just statewide in our infrastructure uh, to lure people onto it. You know, people shouldn't be using transit and bicycles because they want to save the planet. They should be doing it because it's more fun. 
because it's safe, because it saves them time. That's why they should be doing it. Um, and we haven't made the investments to make that happen. And we haven't had people push for that to happen. Yeah, I, I hope that's something that the folks here in this in the Zoom room can help to change. Um, so we just have a couple of minutes left. So I think we just have time for maybe one or two more questions. Uh, what? So we've got one here from uh, Stephanie Mays. What additional data would help drive further funding for active transportation? It appears there's a gap in current usage and connecting cycling usage to other data um, that would help advocate further investment. Uh, there may be a lack of usage data that prior to prioritize decisions. You know, I, I, I couldn't get down to a granular level. I, I will say that having, having sat on SCAG, which is the Southern California Association of Governments, which has all the governments in Southern California, you know, not San Diego, but kind of just above that, you know, involved, you know, cities like Riverside and San Bernardino and Santa Monica, you know, you've got some cities that kind of get it when it comes to tra active transportation, but a lot, most of them don't. And it doesn't seem practical, you know, in Riverside or San Bernardino, they just don't see it as, as something that's real for them, given their land use patterns. So these large planning organizations that prioritize funding, see active transportation, you know, it's like, it's like a nice thing to do when you've got extra money. They don't see it as a real mandate. They just don't think it's real as transportation. You know, when they hear of active transportation, they think about a bike lane in a park, you know, or a bike lane next to the LA River. That's like a fun thing you can do on a weekend, but it's not transportation infrastructure. They think of it as recreation. That's the problem. They think of active transportation as recreation and they don't, and to them, recreation is like, when you have extra money, you put it into recreation. They don't think of it as a fundamental part of mobility. And that's what we have to change. So it's not a legislative issue. It is a culture issue. It's, it's a culture change issue and a mind change issue. And we're just not gonna get the focus on it until people really make that change in their own brain, until policymakers and traffic engineers really believe that people will use it. And in, the, in Los Angeles, they just don't think that most people are gonna use it. They just don't believe it. You know, they will give a lot of excuses. We're hilly, we're spread out, it won't work. So until they start really seeing it really used, you know, the LA River bike path, it's used a lot for recreation. There are probably some commuters, but it doesn't connect right now really safely to the job areas. Uh, and in my community, you can't get to it. You know, I got $20 million for a, a bridge to get to, for people to cross from Glendale to Griffith Park and the LA River bike path. And I just got another 20 million, $40 million for pedestrian and bicycle bridge that, that pays for the entire bridge. You think people in my community are excited about this? 10 people care. The rest of the community is like, oh, okay. So, you know, why do I care about this? They have to take the highway to get to Griffith Park. Or the, or, the, or the zoo or the observatory and people don't care. The city council in Glendale has not mentioned this project once. And I just got them another $20 million to finish the bridge. They haven't mentioned it once publicly. That's what we're up against because their, their constituents aren't saying they care about this. So it's frustrating. They don't see it as something that's important yet. You know, again, we need people at all levels of government who understand this vision. And we need, you know, people like you who are constituents of these people to get them elected and to keep pushing, 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 and to say, this is really important. This is a really big deal. It's not just recreation. This is all of those things. It's public health, it's public safety, it's saving the planet. It really, really is in a fundamental way because they just, they're not seeing it and they're not believing it. Well, fortunately we have over a hundred people here. Many of us are Yay. just concerned citizens who will, be promoting this vision and, and bringing that to our friends, family, communities, and elected officials here. Um, thank you so much, Assembly Member, for, for joining us today. We really appreciate all your wisdom and all your hard work uh, at the Capitol, uh, pushing bicycling and active transit and, and really being a champion for us and, and for the community. I appreciate all of you, and I, I can't thank you enough for your advocacy, for spending the day doing this. Um, I have an eight-year-old. And, you know, I'm hoping that she has a, a, a better world to inherit and it's because of your work. So thank you. 
really appreciate your time and also Thanks. everybody here for being here. Um, I'll just say that this was made possible, of course, by SVBC. Uh, and I continue to live in downtown San Jose, partly because it is bike friendly. Uh, and that was made possible also partly by SVBC. So if you want to be a member, I think there will be a, a link in the chat to on how you can join and get more involved with with the organization. Thanks, everybody.